The Lord be with you. And also with you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. I want to look primarily at James today, the epistle. Um, partially because I think it's the clearest explanation of a theme that runs through both Proverbs, James, the Gospel, and even to a certain extent, the Psalm. And that is the regard to which we, we bring to those who are different to us. And in the Proverbs, it's pretty clear that the difference there is those who have and those who do not. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. Do not exploit the poor because they are poor and do not crush the needy in court. Uh, you know, still there. Uh, the scepter of wickedness shall have no sway over the land apportioned to the righteous. Those who are righteous and those who are wicked. Even in the gospel, we see Jesus engaging with people from Tyre and Sidon. We see him having a conversation with this uh, woman who comes to intercede on behalf of her child. And there's a very interesting conversation, which is worth uh, many Bible studies, I think, between Jesus and her about her role and his understanding. And even the man who is uh, from the region of the Decapolis, Decapolis is ten, ten towns or regions, it's probably Greek, and quite how does he fit into society if he can barely speak? And in a society where, even today, people who can't speak, who can't hear, often find themselves left out. You, you, you can't participate in things in quite the same way. So we have a lot of uh, ways that we carve up the, the line of who's like us and who's not. But James really sort of lays it out. He's not very subtle, you know. Do not show favoritism. Suppose, in theory, and I, I wonder how much of this is one of those. Have you ever heard the thing where someone asks a question, you go, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, and I wonder how much James is going, suppose, in theory... A man comes to your meetings wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. <clears throat> Looking at you. Uh, I wonder how much of that's the case. But regardless, whether it's a hypothetical, an actual hypothetical or not. Suppose a man comes to your meeting wearing gold rings and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes comes in. Are you going to treat them differently or are you going to treat them the same? That's the question, isn't it? And James is pretty clear. You should treat them the same. Here's the issue. James wrote that, mm, let's be generous and say, around, uh, James Pistles, around the year 1890, maybe as late as 110, probably not that late, but sure. So that's 1,900 years. And the challenge is still this. Suppose a man rocks up at church driving a Porsche and someone else comes in smelling a bit funky because the last time he had a shower was when it rained on his head. Are you going to treat them the same? I think the answer is no, we don't, wouldn't. I'm sorry to say, I honestly think that's the answer. And I don't think it's just like us here wouldn't. I think we still need to be challenged by this because we still fall into the habits, the patterns of going, that person is either like us or like we would like to be. You know? We often go, oh, I don't need a fancy car. It's a good, yeah, I want one. Um, I don't, it's not about this, it's not about that. But 
We still we want those things. We buy into the story that we want those things, or that those things are somehow intrinsically good, and so we treat people that way. I'm a migrant to Australia. I immigrated here uh, after I'd done a year of university in South Africa. We came out uh, on, primarily on my mother's qualifications. She's a teacher, and she's a teacher of teachers as well. She had done a lot of work in that area. And I have to be honest and say, I don't think I would be in this country if I wasn't this colour. I don't. I, if I was black, we would never have gotten in. If I was black, my parents would be black. We wouldn't have had the educational opportunities that my mother and father had, and I wouldn't have had the educational opportunities I had. I would not be here if I was black. It's that blunt. It's that simple. But I think it goes deeper than that, and there's more to it than that. I look at our politicians and the things that our media says, and I try very hard to avoid the media these days because it's usually frustrating and makes me cranky. Um, there's enough things in the world to make me cranky. And I hear things like, we've got to watch out for these gangs of black youths, and I think the last one I saw was Melbourne. Realistically, what we need to watch out for is people that drink too much beer and go out and don't have enough to engage them, and that doesn't matter the colour of your skin. Or the other one is people having a go uh, at various different head coverings for Muslim people. Because they look different to us is why politicians do that. It's why our society says it's okay to carve those people out and pick on them. So let's do this. Let's do this. My brothers and sisters, writes James, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, whose mother was an un, whose mother was unwed when he was conceived, who was taken outside the city and killed as a criminal, stripped naked, beaten, and executed. You believe in that? Suppose a woman walks in to your church, and she's wearing a head covering, and it's tatty and old, how are you going to deal with her? I don't think well, unfortunately. And, and please don't take that as a criticism of you and not of me. Because I think I would have a moment that says, oh, or what, or now what, or... Something like that. And I don't have a particular problem with Muslims. I certainly don't have a problem with women. And I know a lot of people who are poor. And I would still have that reaction. So if I'm having it, I'm guessing I'm not alone. So here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Is how do we repent of that? Now repent means to change. Not just feel guilty about stuff. I feel guilty about a lot of things. I grew up in South Africa. White guilt is it's ingrained. But the question isn't how do you feel, but what do you do? What are you going to do so that when that happens, and let's be honest, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if people did turn up at our door and say, hey, we want to worship with you. What are you going to do when they look different to you? What are you going to do so that they don't look around and go, well, I would love to come and hear about Jesus, but those followers of Jesus aren't quite up to scratch. What am I going to do? What am I going to do so that it's different? So that I take seriously the words of James. Part of it is sickness. Part of it is just know that deep in my brain and in my habits, I still see us and them. And if I at least know 
and I can pull it up to the surface and I can turn to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I probably would have been one of those that cheered when your son was dragged out of the city. Help me to be better. And to be conscious that all of us are broken. And if somebody comes in and the brokenness is on the outside, it doesn't mean they're more broken than me. It just means it's on the outside, not the inside. And there's a place of connection. And when we break bread and share it, there's a place of connection. So, yeah, I repent of my sins. I repent of my unthinking us and them. And I encourage you to sit with it and do the same. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.